In Native American and many other indigenous cultures, there is an understanding that human beings are not apart from nature, but part of nature. That whatever we do affects the world around us, that we must attempt to remain in balance in our actions and our thoughts. For countless generations, in every part of the world, in every environment, human beings have survived and made sure this world would be here for the generations after them. Now it seems this may not be the case. And so it is that we need to tell this story. The Indian government has declared an emergency situation in Delhi. The level of pollutants have reached more than 16 times the safe limits. The glacier on Ecuador's most famous volcano and a key source of the capital's drinking water and electricity lost 30% of its mass between 1976 and 1997. 99.84% of the land in the state of California is suffering from drought. Temperatures have risen about twice as much in the Netherlands as globally since 1900. More than a million species face potential extinction as a result of disappearing habitats, changing ecosystems, and acidifying the oceans. The Arctic region may have its first completely ice-free summer by 2040. The effects of climate change don't just happen in a vacuum. The patterns of this global weirding are so vast and interconnected that feedback loops are creating imbalances in all kinds of natural processes. We are already seeing increased extreme weather events, reduced air quality, increased spread of infectious diseases. Not only do these changes affect our lives, they disproportionately affect places and people who lack the resources to adapt and build resiliency. If you are 30 years or younger, there has not been a single month in your entire life that was colder than average. Despite the studies, the knowledge and the scientific consensus, the reality of climate change remains very much a taboo topic in many circles. There has never been a more important time for the environment, for us to show awareness, carry out advocacy, and take ownership over the extent of these problems. I think I've always been very passionate about the outdoors. I've lived in Wyoming since I was 10, technically, so I've always been exposed to mountains and national parks and stuff like that. And I went to camp in, like, middle of nowhere Wyoming. And it's not necessarily that I was exposed to, like, environmental issues, but just, like, being exposed to the outdoors. And then getting to college, I guess, just being surrounded by other people who are just as passionate about protecting the environment and certain classes that I've taken have really opened my eyes. Taking a public lands and oceans class, you can write letter to the editors, like it's possible. And like I got one published in the Jackson Hole Daily and I had this guy like call my home in Jackson and was like, I really loved your LTE about grizzlies, like trophy hunting in Jackson. And I was like, what? I was like, people actually read this? But it's like, it's true. People do actually read that stuff. and like you can make a difference. I think if you like believe you can make a change, you can. If you don't, then you won't. Well, I love art <laughs> and I love making art. I think it's important when art moves somebody and it's definitely a very useful way to reach multiple audiences, especially people who don't really like science. Like a lot of people are like, oh my God, I hate science. But I'm working on incorporating data into my artwork in order to tell a story, in order to say like this is what's happening in this area. Right now I'm trying to use topo maps and elevation profiles of the Tetons in my artwork, stuff that's like very plain and their lines into something that people will be like, wow, what is that about? And then they kind of read about it, they see it. So I'm hoping in the future as well I can continue to create art that will create awareness and move people in a direction to care more about the environment. 
that alternate culture, that sort of um, other way of relating to nature, for example, without all of the infrastructure of the modern West, which comes at a cost, that infrastructure as we are um, keenly and painfully reckoning now, um, that those alternative forms, which had for a long time been denigrated, can actually serve as um, possible solutions or models for how to live in our straightened circumstances of the Anthropocene. If I just stayed in the one place, then you just mostly have the one norm. Thinking about my relationship to the environment, the relationship of my immediate culture to its environment, and then thinking more globally about where we all fall in this extremely uneven um, Anthropocene and what we might learn from, from those alternative practices. I don't think I do anything spectacular um, in terms of being uh, a good global citizen in our era of climate change. I do the ordinary sorts of things, you know, I recycle and um, I, I try to be somewhat aware of my consumption, you know, I don't waste electricity, though I did grow up in this very posh Connecticut suburb. My parents are immigrants from India. We would always spend summers, not every summer, but every third summer or so in India, the whole summer, three, four months, um, living with our relatives in a variety of situations, town, village, etc. Um, and they were, they all had different socioeconomic levels as well. And so living in that world um, really informed my development because I was seeing a very heterogeneous environment frequently and close to home, you know, these were my relatives. Um, and so I had this kind of cultural relativist perspective um, growing up very young, as anyone that's culturally bifid does. Growing up, um, I remember when I used to live in Kenya, we would have uh, load shedding, which is what happens when the government just cuts electricity for a certain period within different areas in the city. You, at a certain time, your certain area is going to have the electricity cut, and if there's no electricity, the water can't get pumped. So it's always this idea of when you do have electricity and water, you want to preserve it as much as you can. I know to take very quick showers. I know when you're washing dishes, for example, you don't just leave the tub running. And little things like that, that I think I wasn't conscious of me necessarily preserving the environment, but just something I've always associated in that water can run out, so just don't waste it. My school is very, um, I think progressive for a typical um, school in, in an African country where we don't really think about conservation in the, in the Western sense, but it is very ingrained in a lot of cultural practices. It just isn't given a name. But I remembered school from 13 years old having Earth Day. And the entire school, this is a boarding school, no lights, no electricity, nothing. They, they, they turned off like, I guess maybe there's a switchboard they turned off everything, so we had to do our homework with candles. So I am, I am public health as well. And I think for me, I've never looked at public health as just the patient side. I think I've always considered the environment because we are a product of our environment. Especially like the diseases that are common back like where I'm from are infectious diseases. And infectious diseases come from, you know, bacteria and a lot of water and sanitation issues. So again, I think I've been privileged enough to have grown up where my water has always been purified um, in some form or the other, but I also know that not everyone has such, a, has such a benefit, I suppose. I think I have to lead by example to start off with. I, I think I can't expect people to change and live a lifestyle I don't do it the, the same, you know. You have to practice what you preach. So I think when I make choices that have an effect on the environment or my health, I need to live by it. So I'm Puerto Rican, second generation born in the United States, um, but my dad was like really adamant about like learning about Puerto Rico and like learning about where I'm from and just like, oh, I was always there every summer I was in Puerto Rico. Um, so 
one of the big things that I learned, and it comes from like our Taino ancestry, is just like the importance of maintaining like the environment and like just taking care of it. It was like it's kind of like you like at the beach surrounded by nature and it would just be like you know not to mess with nature because nature will come back around and that's what it's doing with global warming i mean you have like your science classes like in middle school and stuff like that and like you learn about rocks and all that but like they don't really tell you like what's happening in the world so i think in high school was when i really started like learning about um the environment and like just climate change and stuff like that and getting involved with that. I did a whole internship for the whole my whole junior year in high school working for, it was called Friends of Van Cortlandt Park. And basically we built tr trees in Van Cortlandt Park. Um, we built a garden in Van Cortlandt Park. We visited other farms in the Bronx. Um, and yeah, like we worked in the farm and stuff like that. And it was nice. And that was really what opened my eyes to like, how, wait, hold up, like what? There's farms in the Bronx? like. That. What? Like, Cortland Park is bigger than Central Park? What? It's like you learn. I learned a lot about the Bronx and like learned. That's when like my appreciation to the Bronx like began and learning about the environment in the Bronx and learning about how like like the Bronx can sustain itself without anybody else. So I think that there's multiple ways to um, be environmentally sustainable. Um, and the way that poor people do it and the way that rich people do it are different ways. My family, my family, we eat a lot of leftovers. That's environmentally sustainable. And a lot of times that we are environmentally, um, like, conscious of, not, not conscious, we are envi environmentally sustainable in ways that we don't even realize we are because we're, we're acting on survival. Like, as opposed to people who don't ha have that, like, who have the privilege to really think about, like, okay, recycle and composting and all that, right? There's things that we do that we, we are environmentally sustainable and we don't even realize it because we're just acting on survival. One big thing is, like, water bottles. Like, the conflict between people who are more privileged and not as privileged, water bottles is a big way to, to explain this thing in terms of, like, you see, like, a lot of poor people drinking water bottles and you see like people who are more privileged looking down upon people who drink water bottles because it's not environmentally sustainable, right? But the reason why we're drinking a lot of water bottles is because our water has been contaminated historically and systemically contam contaminated. So I cannot do that, <laughs> you know what I mean? So the way I'm acting on sustainability is not is gonna be different from you and don't look down on my mind. Environmental change is necessary um, and it affects people, poor people of color like it's just another another layer to it, all right? So we, we get, it's just it's another discrimination part of it. So, so in the future, I plan to be a public defender um, and like work for empowering, well, pe people of color are already empowered, but like working toward like accessing, res like giving resources to POCs. And I think that once that happens, because I think environmental change is so intersectional that the people that are at the worst in terms of environmental climate change and all that stuff are POCs. So I think it would trickle down. So I was born in India um, and I grew up in Dubai, Switzerland, Italy, and Sweden. Um, and my parents are now moving to Bangkok, so that's going to be my new home. Um, so I've just been like traveling a lot. It's allowed me to like meet a lot of new people and experience a lot of different cultures and just grow in that sense. I think I first learned about it in middle school. Um, you know, they had this whole, we kind of had this class called Humanities where we just discussed like a lot of social problems, economic problems, um, and so we had this one period where we discussed environmental issues and they talked about you know the polar bears and the ice caps and like I think that was one of the first topics that I was introduced to. I also listened to a lot of music when I was a kid so Linkin Park released that video for what I've done where in the music video you see like a lot of environmental issues and like um, I specifically remember this one scene where um, they showed like this this bird that was just covered in oil and I think that like stood out to me as being like a huge issue is like gas spillage. I think like these issues with animals were the first that I had experienced in terms of environmental issues and then of course later it was climate change and it's definitely more of an experiential thing for me because because I'm so involved in the world of business I 
I've, I've, I'm beginning to see like certain trends in you know people who are investing in companies that are more socially conscious and I think that that's really important now because not just from a business perspective but because now we can help the world through business um, I obviously don't experience the problem I'll be like oh it's a little warmer this year but I'm not gonna be like oh like you know it's like it's a horrible like it's happening in front of me but nowadays you have things like social entrepreneurship which focus on creating a business but then it benefits people who are less fortunate the company that I'm building right now has a lot to do with music and DJing and nightlife and my team and I are recently discussing ways that we can um, help the less fortunate and we're thinking of setting up DJ schools in less fortunate less fortunate neighborhoods where they can learn you know mixing music and producing music and just kind of like using music as an outlet um, as a way to move forward in their lives so I think that regardless of what what you do you can definitely um, include the the social aspect or you can definitely help people out in some way so my name is Anita Joshi and currently I'm working as a naturalist with Pagdandi Safaris I did my electrical engineering from India from uh, in the San Institute of Technology and Management and then I ended up being a naturalist by having my internships done in Great Himalayan National Park and various places in Western Ghats. I am an environmentally conscious person. Since my very childhood, my mother was a teacher, so she has taught me everything. How I can contribute to, towards nature and how I have evolved from nature and how much like the five elements that are present on earth like according to her, she did not believe in nationalism. For her, this complete earth is mother earth and each and everything, like even a rock, has life. So I am told, I am taught that we have to respect everything. I avoid using plastics of every kind. My, Maggie was my favorite food, but I don't eat it because it generates plastic. No straws, least possible uh, garbage and I don't buy so many clothes because I'm, ultimately that also leads to carbon footprints. And I've turned into a vegan because carbon dioxide released and methane gas released by the poultry farm and the cattle farming also contributes to climatic change and leads to global warming. As an electrical engineer, I was doing great with that. But whenever I was inside those cars, I always thought, that what, what am I doing? Why are these non-living things around me? Why am I doing the wiring and writing the electrical documentation? documentation? If at all I could do something that could help the animals who do not speak. I wanted to be the voice of those animals. One day I went and resigned and I came back to India. And I did not have any base. I applied. I was frantically applying for internships and jobs in environmental field. But nobody would take me. So I did paid internships, volunteered for free. And then I got this job. So even if from very childhood you decide to make a change, you can. Because you just have to fight for it. It is going to be difficult because you are making a change and nobody likes changes actually. But this power and empowerment comes within you. All you need is sometimes, especially when you're a woman, you need an approval kind of. So if you have power like masters or you are in a very high post, it gets really easy for you to force your like change that you want to. But when you are in a ground level, you have to work really hard. You have because changing people's mind is very difficult. I want people to be honest and I really want them to respect nature because nature is not their father's property. It is nobody's. It is gifted to us. And by earth, we actually we have got no power to do something for us because earth itself is self-sufficient and can maintain herself. All we need to do is stop destroying it. So we need to maintain the thing called as sustainability. We need to do that. By understanding the ways that those around us are responding and interacting with the ever-present reality of climate change, we can help to encourage one another to make more conscious and responsible choices. You and I leave behind a world very different from the one we live in today for our children and future generations.
My name is Evan Wash. I am 10 years old. If you don't take care of it and you just keep on like throwing garbage and then on then it'll like somehow get to the beach. Like if it's on the beach or litter, it will get into the ocean or lakes and then it can kill fish and all that. The storms will be more deadly and then they'll break all the trees down and then it'll affect the animals that live around it. I'm Lily and I'm eight years old. It means giving fresh air and keeping us alive. Um, my mom talks to me about it a lot at home. She tells us, me and my brother, that we shouldn't take too long of showers. It's making like the whole earth like warmer when like the gas goes out because it's like hot smoke. So like one day it's sunny, and then the next day it's like rainy. We should like keep it clean and we could plant new things to keep it living. Hi, I'm Alex Worsen and um, <laughs> I'm in fifth grade. Nature to me is trees, peacocks, more peacocks, more peacocks, um, grass, flowers, and living organisms. Without nature, there would be no earth, it would just be a brown world, it would be sad. We want to build a sustainable future for all where no one is left behind. Many say the planet will survive, but it is the human race we must fear for. Climate change is a multifaceted problem, and only we can solve this problem, because we are the ones who continue to exacerbate it. Attitudes affect words. Words affect climate change. We, of all varied backgrounds, are impacted by the same in a multitude of ways. Varying ingredients give rise to the growth of a unique individual on this planet. This world is known to be one of complexities and puts forth a variety of obstacles and ladders for each one. We humans are impacted by these differences in a multitude of ways and each of us responds differently. Hence, our understanding and acceptance of such an immense change to our home is varied. We think, we feel, and we act as one race, but not as one being. If there is any story now that is more important to tell than any other, it is the story of this planet, our place on it, and how we may maintain that balance.